First of all, uh, not going to have any special music today. I did uh, think about it, but uh, I wanted to uh, cover a couple of things. This uh, opportunity, Wayne and I, as you know, I'm going to use this besides uh, trying to uh, deliver a message today and uh, but I wanted to use this also a very briefly an opportunity as uh, the annual delegate to the charge conference which happened back first of June I want to make a report and uh, it's going to be pretty easy uh, Wayne was there had in Columbus which he'll be back there again next year but uh, it wasn't, wasn't a lot of, I mean, there's the normal boilerplate legislative things you got to go through, but uh, other than uh, voting on some delegates, and they did reaffirm what I reported on actually a year ago after it came back, but the, the short of it all is nothing's really changed. We're the same church we've been, we're the same church tomorrow, we're the same church today that we're always going to be as United Methodists. The only thing that can change our church is us. As long as we hold and believe in what we believe and what we believe is the divine message of God, then uh, we're going to be, in other words, uh, don't get caught up in the clutter and the banter and everything. Now, the good news for us in the, our conference is we've got some very strong Christian people that are our leaders and our delegates. In 2020, there will be another United Methodist Conference. Uh, it's not going to be on the West Coast. And, but it is going to be in a little bit of tough country. It's going to be in Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you know anything about the political aspects of that part of the country, it's not the most friendly for God-fearing conservative Christians. But uh, like I said, uh, we've got good delegates to arm ourselves. And, but really, the bottom line, you know what the issues have been. Frankly, they've been the same for 20 years. But anyway... The United Methodist Church in our conference is alive and well and frankly I think Centennial is too. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, this morning is uh, and the first thought you all have heard this before, if you have, I don't think so. I gave it, my notes say I gave it on February 3rd now, Calvary. But uh, the title of this message today, and uh, when I gave it, 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 it catches folks' attention pretty quickly. But the title is, Seven Things Found in Hell that need to be in the church. Now just, I'm going to leave that with you. The text for that, this message is Luke 16, 19 through 31. And uh, I'm going to read from the divine word of God. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day lived in a line of luxury. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And I'm going to stop there, and, and there's a reference to let you know. Obviously, the poor man went to heaven. The rich man, 
he went to hell. But I'm going to, another secondary reference is Matthew 8, verses 11 and 12. And I say unto you, to you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom, those living in the world, not living in the godly world, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Moving on with verse 23. And in hell this man lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. In other words, he could see. He was in hell, but he could see heaven and that poor man that actually was there in the arms of God and he cried and said Father Abraham have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame but Abraham said son remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things but now is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they cannot, neither then can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded through one rose from the dead. In reading in reading that, as I said, seven things. Some of them are obvious, some of them are uh, pretty much uh, hidden in between and the perception of what's there. But just in numer numerical order, the very first one, if you see, and it's, it's recorded from verse 23, and remember, these are things that this rich man had it all. You know, the obviously purple, cloaked in purple, purple is a color that symbolized in the Old Testament and even the New Testament riches. And then his poor beggar eating with sores. And, uh, but the one in heaven that went to hell, he looked at and wished he could be in heaven. So the first thing we find in this example is a vision. And uh, obviously that's what we need as a church. We need a vision. And you know, there's a difference between an idea and a vision. There's a difference between uh, programs and a vision. The vision's a bigger, and, and to see it is to feel it and know if it is real. And then you might ask, well, what can a church do or what can a church be? And particularly a small church. Well, I picked up. Uh, these are some things that uh, Cokesbury and United Methodist gives. And, and just tying in with that, they, they, this talks about, about a small church and a small church's role and how they can be. But I'd just like to read something that's kind of keeping our thought process. But, uh, and I've mentioned that I think a couple of conference ago it's brought up the about 75% of the churches in the United Methodist Church are less than 100 members. 
So this is pretty good, uh, all of us are small churches. We hear about the great, grand, the big, the 600, the 1,000, there's a few 2,000 or more membership churches, but the majority of them are kind of like us. And really that's what John Wesley, I mean, uh, he went around, he was more or less circuit rider when he started to form. But let me just read this. These small but vital churches embody Christ's activity in the world. But the trap is thinking we have to get bigger to get better. But the freeing and energizing action is coming to the reality and realizing that we really have to get better to get bigger. Though bigger is not a uh, where they go by itself the goal is to focus on what God would have us do that's being faithful to and focused on the mission is what draws others in think about the practical and emotional attitude that our church members have about ourselves as the church do we focus on our assets, gifts, and relationships with God to be out in ministry? Or do we seek just to hold on to whatever we have left from days gone by? That's uh, kind of a very succinct way of putting it. But in follow-up, number one, coming in verse 22, the first of these things that were recognized kind of as a reflection of what hell was like to this rich man versus some opportunities for our church. But in verse and in hell he lift up his eyes. In other words, he visioned that, being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off. The second was hurt. You know, uh, it's a mystery, you know, heaven is a mystery enough, but, uh, you know, hell's a big mystery to all of us too. Uh, from all accounts that I have found out, it's not going to be real pleasant. So, uh, there's going to be some hurt. Uh, also in the church, there's hurt when we have wronged others. But what we need to draw from that, and in verse 24, again, the, uh, the rich man that was condemned to a life of hurt and sorrow, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. That's pretty, pretty hot. But uh, we do need some pain in the church to temper our faith and temper our Christian armor. Uh, you know, it's the tough times they always say that make you stronger. So feeling a little pain is not a bad thing to actually be in the church. It's what we do with it, what we learn from it, and what we draw from it that matters. Again, as you just heard, moving on, the third thing felt was crying or tears. Uh, we don't need to be too proud in the church to cry or both cry for those that lost or lost loved ones or cry just, you know, there's cries of joy. And that's be, you know, you don't have to cry when you're sad, you cry when you're happy. Uh, and many of us have. The, uh, Johnny's not here, so I won't embarrass him, but uh, again, I go back to Methodist men, another one of the great programs we had is when Johnny Mac gave a testimony, uh, kind of his life and his struggles. And, uh, used a parallel when he lost his son and what that did. They wasn't hardly a dry eye in that group of individuals. So grief, joy, compassion, and a sincere feeling for others 
through crying it's not a bad thing to have in a church there's going to be some in hell but it's for a different reason then if you also heard and I'll read again but uh, the person this rich man condemned to hell he cried out for thirst he asked Lazarus just to dip his finger in water and cool his tongue. Just that little bit. He cried out for thirst. Well, the uh, irony or the metaphor there for thirst that we can carry to our church, even a small church like this, is what's our thirst? Our thirst for knowledge. Uh, we think we know everything about Christianity at times. We think we might know everything about the Methodist Church. We think we might know everything about Centennial United Methodist Church. But we can learn, certainly we can learn every time you pick the Bible up and you read, you're going to learn a lot more. There's things you're going to find out. So having that thirst for knowledge, the thirst for guidance, Guidance from the book, guidance from others, guidance from other good Christian people. And then a, probably a, the toughest thing is a thirst for understanding. Taking what you hear, what we hear, and trying to understand it, trying to have empathy and compassion again. Now, the fifth and moving on down through this text in verse uh, 24 again uh, after it finishes up with him crying out this poor individual quote rich person after he asked for the cooling and tipping the Lazarus to finger he says for I am tormented in this flame this is the other metaphor I think that we can definitely use in our church. You know, in hell it's going to be hot. You know, it's in the flame. You know, it, it's hot. And, uh, but uh, do we have fire in our churches today? You know, what's, we need a fire in our churches today. On fire for Christ. On fire for the gospel. A little more bringing it home. On fire for what we mean to be United Methodists. Are we fired up for Jesus? So, you can see, we, we can, and, and I, I'll, I'll own up to this. I heard this sermon given in a Baptist church here about two years ago. And we were doing something. It was near Veterans Day, and a group of veterans, we were there for a part of the program, but uh, part of that is you got to sit through the sermon. So, and it struck me, it, just like I hope it did you, the title caught me real quick. I mean, that's, that's almost something that uh, I know when we talked about down in Calvary, it, I didn't, well, there was maybe eight or nine that uh, were there, but uh, they woke up. I mean, you know, we got their attention and everything. Yeah, boy, this guy's crazy. I mean, what's he gonna say about this? But I wanted to give credit where credit's due. I took notes, and then I went back and I read it, because I was like, I was curious about this, I'm thinking. But we've gotten all the way down to verse, and, and going again, parts of it in 24. Uh, and I'm going to read some of it again. It goes into verse 25. But uh, the sixth, the next, the last thing that we need that's found in this text of the, the uh, kind of the uh, comparisons between hell and heaven and why we frankly want to go to heaven, but uh, is a concern for the lost. And, and here again, verse 25, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted. In other words, Lazarus has gone to heaven, and uh, 
perceived good things even though he lived a worldly life through torment. And then comparing that to this rich man that had all sorts of good things happen in his life, he said, Thou art tor tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from thence to you cannot, neither can thou, th they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. So there's concern for the lost. Uh, even going back, and this one's a little reversed, it's concerned for that that's condemned to hell. You can't do anything about it. It's going to be too late. But, concern for the lost. Uh, to me, that's obvious in our churches that ought to be one of our biggest goals, our great, you know, go, our commission, the great commission, go therefore into the world and preach the gospel. Uh, but we need to express that concern. We need to show it. We need to wear it. And as best we can, we need to live it. Then, the final of these things found in hell that need to be in our church, the most obvious one and the last one is a prayer. Verse 27, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. In other words, you know, Lazarus, you know, he's praying that others will be brought into the body of Christ and that they'll eventually be able to live eternity in heaven not condemned to hell. But the prayer that we need to give in our churches is a prayer to God. And too many times we confuse this with a prayer to ourselves and that it's a selfish prayer. But as we conclude today, our prayer for just this church for us as Christians would be as it's written that thy will be done, not ours. <coughs> and that we also pray within our churches today for guidance and leadership and also for forgiveness. Then uh, I want to close today with uh, Ephesians two verses seven. Actually, I'm going to back up. I'm going to close and read from verses four through seven. This is Ephesians two. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that we can come together, to come together as both a church and as Christian brothers and sisters, that we can learn that through your word, we can grow in both faith and we can grow in our witness and our see and give us vision of opportunity. Help us to share a spirit of fire and, and, and uh, proud vision for our church today. 
be with us as we go out and through the world. Help us to especially be aware of what we can do as examples of Jesus Christ here in Greater County, Georgia. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this message from Reverend Wayne McDonald. We would like to take this time to invite you to learn more about our churches by visiting us at calvarycharge.com or by following us on Facebook at Calvary Bethel Centennial. Remember that we are alive together in worship. As Ephesians 2, 4-5 says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Thank you.